Hey, beautiful people. We're going to go over chapter 17, hairstyling part two today in your Cosmo Milady book. And we're going to start where we left off from part one with finishing hair, finish hair using basic blow drying styling. Just a little quick recap on it. You don't want to hold the blow dryer too long in one place on your client's head. It can cause burning on the client and very uncomfortable for the client. You wanna constantly use a back and forth motion when you're using the blow dryer and you wanna direct the hot air away from the client's scalp always. Just in case the client's hair holds a lot of water, you wanna be able to blow dry that section for as long as you need to, to get it fully fully dry. You all, And you also wanna direct the hair from the scalp towards the end of the hair because the end of your hair is the oldest part of the oldest hair on your head and it can hold the most water so you want to make sure those ends are dry you want to make sure they're smoothed out and not frizzy and it looks finished and uh, you also want to partially towel dry your hair before you blow drying i also recommend squeezing the hair out or doing a towel wrap with the hair to try and get as much of the water out of the hair as well as you can pre-dry the hair, power dry the hair to get a little bit more water out, about 65 to 75% dry based off, depending on the clients and how quickly their hair dries. Tools for blow drying. Use a blow dryer, of course. And the blow dryer, the blow dryer is an electrical appliance designed for drying and styling hair. It is its main parts are the handle, which is this part of the blow dryer, slotted nozzle, small fan, heating element, and speed heating controls. Some blow dryers also come with cooling buttons. Majority of blow dryers come with cooling buttons. I have yet to see a blow dryer that does not have a cooling button. And then that cooling button can be used to help set the hair. So if you say you're doing a round brush curl and you want to cool it down a little bit faster, you would do the round brush curl, put, put the blow dryer in and hit it with the cool shot. So it cools the heat, takes the heat out, cools it and sets that curl in place. And then you can release and drop that curl, which is very fun. And it's really cute. And you have, And then you have the temperature control, control switch, which helps to produce a steady steam of hair at the desired temperature. So it's high, medium, low on the temperatures. Don't, they don't have degrees. It's not a flat iron or a curling iron. It's just high, medium, low. And then you have um, high, like a, the hottest temp. You have low temp. And you have your cool. And then it blows out. You can blow it out to where it's blowing out a lot of air, airflow, or just a little bit. Every blow dryer settings are different, but they all do the same thing. They're just labeled differently. That's what sets each blow dryer apart. The blow dryer's nozzle attachment or the concentrator, which is on here, they have a diffuser, but they have different concentrators that attach to the nozzle is the, a directional feature that creates a concentrated stream of air. Then you have your diffuser. Your diffuser is what is pictured on the blow dryer, is an attachment that causes the air to flow more softly and it helps to accentuate or keep textural definition. So people normally use diffusers when they're trying to diffuse curls, put set them in place. And it's mainly for people with textured hair or if you're trying to create a little bit more volume with the textured hair, you can use a diffuser at the roots and move it in a circular motion. And it will also diffuse that hair, set that hair and give you some volume and also keep those curls in place. Then we have these different types of combs and picks. Combs and picks are designed to distribute and part the hair. They come in all different kinds of sizes and shapes and colors. And they also help you do many different styling options. They have different lengths and spacing of teeth. 
that vary from comb from one comb to another. And some teeth are closely are closely spaced, which remove the definition from the, the curl and create a smooth surface. Like your styling comb, which is here where the teeth are super, super close together, that will give you a really smooth look, opposed to how this one's a little bit wider, it won't create that smooth look that you may possibly be looking for. In combs with a pick at one end, lift the hair away from the head. So you have combs right here with the pick on the end. You can use these to lift the hair away from the head. And they're really good, useful combs. I like these combs. It's like a two-in-one type of thing. You can also use this comb to, use to do back combing. You can actually use any of these combs to do back, back combing. One, like if you were to use this styling comb with the smaller teeth to back comb, you'll get a really, really tight, tight back combing. And they're really good. Then you have different types of brushes. You have classic styling brush. You have a paddle brush. You have a grooming brush, you have a bent brush, you have a round brush, and you have a teasing brush. When you're, when you're wanting to choose a brush to style someone's hair, you wanna take into account the texture of the client's hair, the length the client has, and the style that the client is looking for, or what you're trying to do with this brush to achieve the look, the desired look you're going for at the end of your service. Brushes do come in different sizes, shapes, materials. They come with nylon bristles. They come with um, more bristles. Then you have your paddle brushes or your wet, your detangling brushes that have the beads, they're plastic and they have the beads on the end. Those are better to go through wet hair. So they all come, they come very in various types to achieve different things. A classic styling brush is a half round rubber base brush. These brushes typically have either seven or nine rows of round tip nylon bristles. And they are, to, they are heat resistant anti-static and ideal for smoothing and untangling all types of hair. They're also low. I'm a round brush kind of girl. I do pretty much anything with a round brush. I used to use a lot of like Denman brushes and paddle brushes, but then once I started working at Dry Bar and in around 2015, I think it was, I fell in love with the round brush. Round brushes are light. Then you have paddle brushes. With their paddle brushes have their large, their flat bases, and they're well suited for mid length to longer length hair. Some people I've seen um, different stylists use paddle brushes to blow out hair, and that's definitely okay to do. It's not going to melt or but it, it won't give you like that completely smooth look that you're looking for. Some of them do have ball tip nylon pins on them and they're staggered pin patterns that help to keep the hair from snagging. So they're good for that. So if you have somebody whose hair tangles a lot, then you, I would suggest using the paddle brush to get the tangles out and kind of smooth it out. And then if you want to go back in with a round brush to smooth it out a little bit more and get it and get that finished look that you're looking for, then you can also do that as well. Then you have grooming brushes. They're gener generally oval with a mixture of bore and nylon bristles. The bore bristles help distribute the scalp oils over the hair shaft, giving it the shine that you're looking for. Bore bristles are really good to, to put shine through the hair from roots to ends. And they're also really good for people who, are, who have texture as well. The nylon bristles stimulate the circulation of blood to the scalp and grooming brushes are particularly used for adding polish and shine to fine to medium hair. They are great for combing out updos. This is very true. Not grooming brushes are great for combing out updos. They give it, they allow it to go through the hair and polish it, smooth it out. So say you're doing like a back combing or back brushing, then you want to use a grooming brush to smooth it out, 
smooth it out and make it look neat, especially when you're gonna updo. These come, these brushes come in place, come in play a lot, and they're very helpful. We have vent brushes with ventilated design brushes. With sorry, let's restate that it's whole sentence all over again. Vent brushes with their ventilated design, they're used to speed up the blow drying process, and they're out, they're ideal for blow drying fine hair and adding lift to the scalp. Vent brushes on fine hair, they help them so much because their hair is typically flatter to the head. So a vent brush will allow you to, to lift the scalp a little bit, lift the hair at the scalp, give them some volume. Also will dry the hair because the heat is going through the the brush because it's ventilated so it's like holes so once you put the blow dryer on it the heat is distributing throughout the whole brush and it's not just being it's not just hitting the brush and popping off it's going through the whole entire brush and it's going to heat through the whole entire hair section that you're using and it will dry a lot faster i like using these brushes when i'm trying to get a client out fast because i don't have to worry about going over the section 5,000 times because the air flow is going through the brush and hitting all areas of the head. Now let's get to my favorite brush of all the brushes. Round brushes come in various diameters. The client's hair should be long enough to wrap twice around the brush. Round brushes often have natural bristles, sometimes with nylon mixed in for better grip. Smaller brushes add more curl. Larger brushes straighten the hair and bevel the ends of the hair. So smaller brushes, smaller round brushes, are my absolute favorite. So if you ever see me styling somebody's hair or we're doing hair in class, I'm most likely gonna have a smaller round brush because it gives you curl, it gives you volume. I can also smooth it out. I can also just make it straight and bevel the ends, bend the ends, and you're able to do a lot more with a round brush. You can't take as much hair with a round brush, but if you're moving faster, if you're a person who can move faster through the hair with a small brush, you can get it done in just the same amount of time as if you were to use a larger round brush. Larger round brushes, they straighten the hair and bevel the ends, this is very true, but you can also do all the same styles with um, a small brush, but with the larger brush, you won't get a tight of a curl. If you're doing a round brush curl, you'll get a looser curl in the hair, but it's typically, larger brushes are used to make it straight, give a little bit of volume, bend the ends, smooth it out. So if I know someone doesn't want no curl and I know that that's what they always get and that they're regular, I'm gonna not waste my time, not waste their time. And I'm just gonna use a, a larger round brush. It's just easier and more convenient and it gets the job done straight to the point. It's not gonna put a curl in the hair and you don't have to worry about trying to blow dry that curl out if you're using a, a larger round brush. But if you're gonna use a smaller round brush, then expect to put a, have a curl put in the hair regardless because of the way that you're round brushing the hair, it's automatically naturally just gonna have a curl. So if you don't want that, you don't have to work harder, use a larger round brush. 
medium round brushes can be used to lift the hair at the scalp. Some round brushes can be used, some round brushes can be used to lift the hair at the scalp. I reread that whole sentence all over again. I apologize. Some round brushes have metal cylinder bases so that the heat from the blow dryer is transferred to the metal base, creating a stronger curl that is similar to those produced with an electric roller. That is very, very true. These types of brushes, they act, I've explained it to like a coworker of mine before when I was trying to teach her how to round brush as well. When you're using that, this type of brush, treat it like if you're using an electric roller or if you're using a curling iron, that the metal is acting like that, but it's just in brush form. So if you want to put the heat on there, blow dry it, round brush, curl it, back and forth movements, giving it all the movement that you're looking for, putting that tight curl in there. And once you have the brush semi off the scalp with the blow dryer directed and the heat directed away from the client's scalp, you can let it sit there for a little second to put some heat, but you're constantly moving it side to side. So it's just not sitting in one place. And that heat is being transferred throughout the whole length of the round brush. It will heat up that brush, which will cause the the heat to set in and make a stronger curl from that round brush that you're doing. I love it for this type of style. If I know that the client doesn't want me to put any, doesn't want me to use any curling irons after I finish blow drying or any flat irons, then I'll use this type of brush so I can give them that blow dry curl without having to use a curling iron or a flat iron to put a curl in the client's hair. And it will be a complete finished style once I'm done blow drying my favorite like I love it a teasing brush is a thin nylon styling brush that has a tail for sectioning so your teasing brush would be this pink brush here would be the pink brush here and you can use it for for sectioning the hair that's what the point is for it allows you to create a section throughout the hair and the teasing brushes are perfect for back back combing and the sides of the bristles are ideal for smoothing it into the desired style. So when you're using the teasing brush, you normally do it when you're wanting to add volume to a client's hair if they want more volume. Or we typically use them when you're doing updos and you're trying to create that height in the hair. And then once you've created that tease in the hair from the round from the back brushing and back combing, then you'll take the sides of the brush and literally place it on the side and it will smooth the hair out. It's perfect for that. And it's a great brush to have in your collection of brushes.
Section and clips usually are metal or plastic, and they have long prongs to hold wet or dry sections of hair in place, and it keeps the wet hair sectioned off and separate from the section that is being styled or blow dried. With clips, they come, they have the duck bill clips that look like a, a duck's mouth. Those ones that I usually use for people who have thicker hair and I wanna hold it all in place and they, they'll they hold and clamp onto the hair and keep it in place. Sometimes you have to use two if it's a little on, more on the thick side, but those generally are what I use and what I see a lot of other clients using. Then you have the clips that they look flat, they're flatter. Those ones you can use for, if you wanna just clip a section of hair away and it's like laying flat, you're not wrapping it, you can use those to lay, lay it flat. You have metal clips that you can use for like pin curl clips. You can use the metal ones to hold hair in place to, to set a curl when you're blow drying it and you're doing a round brush curl. You can take the hair, pull it up, pin it up with the metal pin and go about the rest of the um, sections without that dried curled hair that's setting in place being touched by the wet hair. So clips are good for that. You can use them when you're, you use clips when you're cutting hair. You use clips when you're sectioning the hair off. You want to separate the hair. You use clips when you're blow drying hair. You use clips when you're coloring hair. You're always using clips. Have 5,000 clips if you can. I can't even tell y'all how many clips I have. Like I have a lot, it's kind of excessive. I'm always buying clips, different cell colors, different um, designs. Always have clips, just in case you drop one, you don't have, you have 5,000 more to pick up and you can keep going through your service and it's just a constant motion. It's not a stop, I have to clean this, sanitize this clip so I can put it back in your hair. No, drop it, leave it alone because you have 5,000 more. And you can continue moving through your service and it's swift and it flows together and it looks like you know what you're doing and you're prepared and ready for anything that happens. Always have a lot of everything that's going on, especially clips, especially combs, and especially brushes because sometimes they can slip. Brushes can slip when your hands get wet and they can drop. You want to make sure you have an extra one so you don't have to stop your syrup, stop what you're doing, clean it, disinfect it, sanitize it dry it off and put it back in the client's hair. Always make sure you have a good amount of everything. Styling products. Styling products you have, you have foam or mousse, you have gels, you have liquid gels or texturizers, and you have straightening gels. With styling products, they can be thought of as a liquid tool because you're using this product as a tool to set you up for your style, for your styling. So say you're doing just a basic blow dry and the client's hair, you want to put in a, a spray thermal um, heat protectant, or you want to put in a, a leave-in cream, or you want to put in a volumizing mousse. These individual tools are setting you up for success to give the client what they're looking for out of their hair service. You also have like products like pomades, waxes, you have hairspray, you have, like I stated earlier, thermal protection. These are all different kinds of products. Can y'all think of any other styling products out there that y'all have used or uh, when you've gotten your hair done, the stylists have used? Let's drop them in the chat and see what y'all come up with. Should be very interesting because there's a lot out there and a lot of people use a lot of different things. So with so many styling products on the market, stylists need to carefully consider their option before applying one of these products to a client's hair. You first, you want to know how long does the style need to hold? So if it needs to hold for two days, does it need to hold for the rest of the day? Does it need to hold for the night? Does it need to hold for a weekend? Or they want their hair to last a week? You need 
those also come into play when you're doing your consultation. You need to figure out how long they want this style to last. And that will also help you determine what products you're going to use. You also want to check what does it look like outside? Is it humid outside? Texas is almost always humid. So you want to take that into consideration. You want to take if it's dry outside. You want to take if it's raining outside. If the wind is blowing something crazy, you want to add a little bit more hairspray to keep that hair in place. You want to know what the client is wearing. When you're deciding on a style.
You also must consider the hair type. If it's fine, coarse, straight, curly, when you're deciding on what product to use, the heavier products work work by causing strands of the hair to clean together, adding more pronounced definition, but they can also add weight to the hair. So you don't wanna use a heavier product with somebody who has fine or thin hair, because it's just gonna weigh their hair down, it's gonna make the hair look dirty, and it's gonna make them wanna feel like they're gonna have to need their hair to get washed again, and you don't want that. Styling products, they do range from light hold to very firm holds. You have some that are weightless, that are really good for people who have fine hair, thin hair, or who don't like a lot of product or don't want to feel like they have a lot of product in their hair. You want to use those that products that are more light or weightless on those types of clients who want that type of look. Then you want to desire, determine the amount of support desired and choose accordingly. A little goes a long way. Even though it says it's weightless, you still don't want to overdo it with those products because it's a product, so you're st you can over product a client's hair, whether it's weightless or a light product. So you want to choose the amount that you're going to use based off the client's hair texture and what they're looking for. The, the kind of silent products that they have, they have foam, which is also like a mousse. You have volume foam, volumizing foam, which can give you like a medium hold, or they have some with a light hold. They're very light, they're like whipped. So you shake it and you put it in your hand and it like swells up and it looks like shaving foam. It gives you a little bit of volume, a moderate body and volume in the hair. You wanna massage it when the hair is wet into the hair and, and to highlight some texture move, movement, you can blow dry it or for, uh, sorry. You can blow dry it straight for styles wind body without texture desired. So if you want to give the hair a body and then no texture desired, you can still use the volumizing foam. Just don't overdo it and massage it around the root area and slightly towards the mid shaft of the hair. And that will help you when you're blow drying the hair, give you a little bit of lift, get a little bit of body and some volume without it causing it to be too producty too much product in the in the hair foam is also good for fine hair because it does not weigh the hair down I use a foam on my clients who who they do have finer hair or it's um or thin on the thinner side or if they don't have volume I'll use volumizing mousse on those clients because it's once you put it in the hair, it kind of like dissolves. So it doesn't weigh their hair down and they can get body and they can get volume and it makes them feel their hair look fuller and it, the clients love it. So it's just a little extra oomph to the hair. And then you also have conditioning foams, which are excellent for drier, more porous hair. And you have gels. Gel is a thick and styling preparation that comes in a tube or a bottle. A gel creates the strongest control for a slicked or model, molded style. So say you have, you're doing a men's hairstyle and he, he this particular client likes gel because it holds better because their hair is on the coarser side or it's, it's heavy so it gets way down. So they need this hair to, to gel because it's strong to hold their hair in place. You can use gel and it will keep that hair molded and in place. or Sometimes people, women who have curly hair, they like to use gel because it'll hold that curl into place without it frizzing up quick quickly or getting messed up from the wind. It'll just hold it in place. So people use gel for different types of reasons. So when your hair is brushed out, gel creates long lasting body. You have firm hold gel, formulations they don't when firm hold gel you don't want to use them on fine hair because of the high resin content this is I would say if you're going to do that and the client wants that okay but use a small amount of it unless that client suggest you use more because that's how they do their hair on a normal basis then 
do that because they'll be okay with that. But you have to talk to the client. You have to have an understanding. Liquid gels, also known as texturizers, are similar to firm hold gels, except that they are lighter and less vicious, so more liquid in the form. They help for easy styling, defining, and molding. So say you're doing a client who has a pixie and you're doing you're going to use a liquid gel you can place that liquid gel and mold the hair so you're doing finger waves like how we discussed in the previous chapter the previous section part one finger waving you can use a liquid gel to form and mold the hair so it doesn't move and that can last the client for at least a week depending on how they style and protect their hair when they're at home. You have straightening gels. Straightening gels apply to damp hair. Straightening gel is applied to damp hair, ranging from wavy to curly hair, or when it's blown dry, it creates a smooth, straight look that provides the most hold in dry outdoor conditions. Your straight, straightening gel counters frizz by coating the hair shaft and weighing it down. So if you have someone who has really frizzy hair and they want to, they were asking for like what kind of product will help control that frizz, suggest them a straightening gel every time because it will put a coating over the hair to keep it weighed down, to keep that frizz weighed down. It's a temporary solution. It's not a permanent fix. So it will not fix their frizz. It will always come back. It's just in that moment for that style, it will control that frizz. Once they wash the hair, shampoo the hair, it's going to come out and they'll have to reapply it all the time. Then you have... <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. So volumizers, when sprayed into the roots of fine hair, and when the hair is blown dry, it adds volume, especially at the base. When you use a vent brush or a round brush, like how we discussed a couple of slides ago, it is used in the hair and is not stretched too tightly around the brush. And even more volume can be achieved. You may want to add a light gel or a mousse to the rest of the hair for more hold, but be careful to avoid the roots and the base of the hair that's already been treated with a volumizer. And they say that because if you're, so that you don't block the volumizer from doing its job. So you do want to make sure you're keeping an eye on where you're putting that volumizer, where it's stopping, and then you can put another styling product towards the rest of the hair towards the end from mid shaft to ends of the hair. You don't want to overlay a product when you're using a volumizer because a volumizer is supposed to create volume with the root. It's a special product for that, for that root area to create that volume when you're blow drying and setting it in place. So just keep in mind, you don't want to over product, overlay another product on top of this volumizer. Just keep in mind where you're putting it. Then you have pomades, which are also known as waxes. They're considerably, they add considerable weight to the hair by causing strands to join together. Showing separation in the hair, used on dry hair, pomades make the hair very easy to hold. But be careful to avoid the roots and base of the hair that has already been treated with volumizer. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, y'all. I didn't read up. Let's redo that. Pomades make the hair very easy to mold, allowing greater manageability. 
it should be used sparingly on fine hair because of the weight and as a man's grooming product. I typically use this on men's hair. Sometimes I'll use it on women with short haircuts because it's good for styling and placing their hair where you want it to go. Palmy, they have a good amount of shine to them and a good amount of hold. It's kind of like in the middle. I have an equal amount of shine and an equal amount of hold. So they're good for, for something like that, especially if a client wants some shine, but it doesn't want it to be super, super shiny. Then you can use a, a pomade. You have silicone, which is also known as serum. So you have like So silicones are also known as serum. It's like a gloss. So you have, I know you've probably heard of like, like a, a gloss serum. It adds shine to the hair. Some people normally use it as a heat protection. There's, you also have non-oily uh, silicone products, which are excellent for all hair types. They provide protection when you're blow drying the hair. You can also use it when your the style is finished and you want to just seal it and add a little bit of shine you can use the serum and you can mix a couple of different drops with most styling products so like if you want to mix it put a couple of different couple of uh, a couple of shots or pumps of a serum in a foam you can do that and mix it together to add a little bit more shine to that foam if it doesn't have that much or you want a little bit more you can do that and mix it together and that is totally fine you can also mix it like if you have a thermal protect thermal protectant and you want to put a little bit of shine so you don't have to add that at the end you can also do a couple of pumps and thermal protectant and work it through the hair as well as like a leave-in conditioner you can also do that same thing with the client if you have a spray leave-in conditioner you can also do the same thing with the serum serums are awesome i love them i i especially use them once i'm done with the style or a blow dry and it has a little bit too much has a little bit more frizz than i like so i'll take a little bit of serum a little goes a long way i can't stress that enough and pump it into my hands rub it through my hands all on my hands like i'm putting on lotion and then i'll work my hands through the client's hair with the serum and it will coat it with a little bit of the, the serum, add a little bit of shine and finish off that style. It gives a little bit of gloss, makes it look healthy and clean. Maintaining safety in thermal hairstyling. Methods of waving and curling straight or pressed hair using thermal irons and special manipulative techniques. I'm sorry, I was moving a little bit too fast and I skipped the last two. So let's go over the last two. You have hairspray, known, also known as finishing sprays. It is applied in the form of a mist to hold a style in position. It is most widely used, is most widely used hairstyling product and it is available in both aerosol and pump containers and in a variety of holding strengths. You have a light hold, a medium hold, strong hold, you have a flexible hold. 
all different types of hairsprays for all different types of holes. The finishing spray is used when the style is complete and will not be disturbed. So once you are completely done with this hairstyle and the client, you've shown the client the hairstyle, the client approves, the client's happy, then you go in and use a hairspray. If you are not done with the hairstyle and the client does not approve of the hairstyle, do not put hairspray in the hair. You only want to do this once the client has seen the style because it they have not seen the style and you go and put hairspray in the hair, you will have to rewash the whole entire head to take that hairspray out because you cannot add more to that hair, that hairstyle, unless you are combing it out and just like fixing a section or two with the comb or something, then you can reapply some hairspray. But if you're going to use a heat tool or anything like that, you don't want to hairspray because it's going to make it harder to do. It's going to hurt the client because it's hairspray. It's supposed to keep the hair intact and not be able to move. So again, if you're going to use hairspray, use it at the very end of your service and make sure the client is happy with their, their hair before you spray the hairspray on their hair. Then you have thermal protection, which is also known as your heat protection, which we've all used, we all know about. Everybody should have some. If you do not have some in your house, go get some, especially if you do your hair with flat, if you flat iron your hair or, your, or you curl your hair, even if you blow dry your hair, put a thermal protectant in there because you can get, burn your hair and thermal protectant will help you protect against the heat and will not, and will help you prevent heat damage. And it can come in a spray, it can come in a cream, it can come in a mousse, and it can come in a serum. More times than not, if you read the back of products, the majority of products already have a form of a heat protectant in them, but then you also have those products that are just strictly heat protection. So if you have products that have heat protectant in them and you're adding more heat protectant, that's totally okay. You're just doubly, doubly, I don't even know if that's a word, but we're going to use it, protecting the hair so that they they don't have heat damage, they don't get heat damage, and their hair is remaining healthy. Always use a heat protectant all the time. Now let's get to where we need it to be when you're maintaining safety and thermal styling. Thermal waving and thermal curling, also known as Marcel waving, there are different methods of waving and curling straight or press dry hair using thermal irons and special special manipulative techniques. Your thermal iron can be either electric or stove heated and it has been modernized so successfully that they are more popular today than ever before. So now nowadays they have like your hot combs and they have your Marcel thermal irons that are electric and you can plug them in. A long time ago, they were only able to be put on the stove. You weren't able to plug them in. So they've, they've come a long way from where they used to be. A thermal iron has four, pot, four parts. You have your rod handle, your shell handle, your barrel or your rod, and the shell, which is movable. I'm gonna say that again because that is one of your questions on your on the verification questions. You have the rod handle, which is here. You have your shell handle, which is here. You have your barrel or rod, which is here, and you have your shell, 
which is the part that moves up and down and it spins and it goes around the hair. So your thermal iron is an implement that is made of quality steel that, are, that is used to curl dry hair. They produce an even amount of heat that is controlled by the stylus. And electric curling irons have, I can't say that word, let's try it. Cylindrical barrels ranging from a half inch to three inches in diameter. Then you have your non-electrical thermal irons. They are favored by many stylists who cater to clients with excessively curly hair. These are the ones that go in the stove that we see in um, typically like my like my mother-in-law, she she uses the ones that go on the stove because she does a lot of hair that requires them. Like in this image here, but hers is a little different. And it, help, it helps smooth the hair out. It gets a little bit more hot. I personally don't like the stove, but that's just me. And I feel like hairstylists and curling irons and hot combs and the non-electrical thermal irons, we've come a long way to where we don't have to use them and we can still get the same effect with the electrical thermal irons that you could with the non-electrical thermal irons. And then you have your flat iron. Your flat iron ranges in size from a half inch to three inches across, and it is used to create smooth, straight styles. I it all it also can be used to create curls. I am a person, a stylist who creates curls with the flat iron as well. I personally think you get more, it, it smooths it at the same time and you also curls it. So it gives it a longer lasting style. That's why I choose to use a flat iron when I curl. So I do have a curling iron as well, but majority of the time I use a curling iron to also curl hair, smooth hair as well. So you can use that for both, not just for smoothing, not just for smoothing hair and creating the, and making the hair straight. So flat irons have two hot plates ranging from a half inch to three inches. And flat irons with straight edges are used to create smooth straight styles, even on very curly hair. Your flat irons with beveled edges can be manipulated to bend or curl the ends. When the, what they say by that is when you have a flat iron, the, when the edges are, the edges right here, are straight when you're going to try and bend it or try and curl it it will put a little bend on it so you want if you're trying to bend the edges or curl it you want to use a flat iron with beveled edges so it it's a little bit more rounded so it's able to do move the hair and make it go around and not hit that straight edge to create that bend in the hair the edge nearest the stylus is called the inner edge. The one furthest from the stylus is called the outer edge. So when you're holding your, your flat iron and you're placing the flat iron on the, on the hair, the edge that, that you can see that is closest to you is your inner edge. And the one that is on the outside closest to the client's head, that is your outer edge. As we go, as time goes on, they're constantly improving these flat irons. And there are so many different types of flat irons out there that you can use. There are some that are lightweight. There are some that are heavier. You have co different colors. You have, I've seen one where they put water in, which I think is crazy. If y'all haven't seen it, Google it, YouTube it. I believe it's on, it's somewhere in Google but you put water in it and it's supposed to straighten the hair with steam. I don't understand that concept personally because I've always been taught that you do not put a flat iron on wet hair. You will burn it, it will ruin it. So I don't understand that concept of how that works. But 
technology has come a long way. So we're going to let that person who created that and into that be great. You also have ergonomic grips on flat irons. You have some with better heat controls, some that range from the, uh, you can get as low as, some go as little, as low as I want to say to 250, 300, all the way to, to 450 degrees. Some don't have a heat setting at all. It's high, medium, low. You don't want to get those. You want to get the ones that have a heat setting where you can determine the temperature of it. So you have better control of what of the heat when you're on of the heat settings. Here's your It's always important to analyze and understand the condition and texture of the hair before you set the heat. If the hair is not strong enough to sustain being flat ironed, do not, I'm sorry, do not do it. Do not use it. It's just going to cause more damage than it needs to. Hair that has been bleached is extremely delicate and can break off or melt with excessive heat. So if you're use, using a flat iron and somebody who has been bleached has really has blonde hair you want to set the temperature on the lower setting below below 400 maybe 360 380 so that their hair does not break off and it does not melt also you want to use lower settings for fine hair and you can use the higher settings for coarse hair curly hair thick hair because their hair is strong enough to hold that heat when you're you know working like sections between one and a half, I mean to a half to a one inch section, and you want to use slow, 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 smooth motions on the hair with that has little has little more resistance. So let me break that down because that was a tongue twister for me. So the way that I do it is I work in sections that are smaller than the the thickness of my flat iron. So a half to a one inch section. You wanna use, you wanna go slow, but you don't wanna go too slow. And you wanna keep it smooth. So it's nice to use a comb uh, to follow your flat iron as you go down and it will help heat all the hair strands. And if you go, if you're going in that slow motion and you're, you don't, it will create, and you have little resistance it will get the hair straight, get the hair smooth, and you don't have to go over it 5,000 times to get it smooth. You can go over it maybe once or twice and get that hair smooth.
And it's always very, very important before you're gonna do any thermal service to use a heat protectant. Um, if you don't use any other product on the client's hair because this client says they don't like product, you're still gonna use a heat protectant on the hair. And if they're like, well, I don't want that, you have to be firm and tell that client why this is important for their hair and tell them that this is gonna help prevent heat damage. And I guarantee they'll allow you to do that. That might be the only product that you are able to use for that client and that is okay. But always put a heat protectant in your client's hair, no matter what. Because you don't want that client to come back to you and say, oh, my hair is fried and burnt off. We don't wanna do that, let's prevent that. Let's, let's cross off. Let's all dot all of our I's and cross all of our T's. When you're testing, when you're testing a thermal iron, you want to clamp the heat iron over some tissue. Sometimes you can use like the in wrap paper when you're doing the perm, you can use that. Um, or you can use a piece of paper. But if the paper scorches, that means it's too hot and you need to let it cool down a little bit before you place it on the client's head. Because if it's burning that paper, it's gonna burn the client's head and you don't want that. You don't want that to happen on the for, um, when you're doing the client's hair. So just, just take a second and test it before you put it on the client's hair because you have like your non-electrical thermal irons, those ones, there's no, there's no heat setting, it's in a stove. So it can get super, super hot if it's sitting there too long. So you wanna always constantly test it. That way you're knowing what it will do when you're using it on your client's hair. That's why majority of stylists now we use the electrical thermal irons that have heat settings. So we're able to control how hot it gets. To take care of your thermal iron, you wanna be sure to check the manufacturer's just destructions, directions for care and cleaning. You wanna dampen a towel or rag and wipe down the barrel of the iron with a soapy solution containing a few drops of ammonia. It just helps get the product off the, of the thermal iron and it helps clean it. You just wanna wipe it down. I do this, I wipe down my uh, flat irons before a client, or if I'm doing like a lot of clients back to back and it's like boom, 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 I'll do it at the end of the day and just wipe it down and just put a few drops of ammonia on there to clean it off and clean it down. Or if you have time in between clients and you space it out and you're not like running behind, then you can wipe it, wipe it out um, before your client, before you start to flat iron the client's hair. If you're using a non-electrical thermal iron, you wanna immerse the barrel in the solution because it doesn't have the electrical um, connection is you're able to immerse it, immerse it in the solution and clean it off. You do not clean your iron when it is turned on or when it is still cooling from a previous styling service because it can burn. So if it's still hot, wait till it's cooled down and then clean it off. Do not plug it up. Do not do it in the middle of your um, of your service because it will burn it with the solution if you have that solution or the towel or the cloth is wet. Now, sometimes for me, if it's just like looking or feeling weird or I just, it looks like there's too much on the uh, flat arm uh, plates, I'll take a dry cloth with no cleaning solution on it, nothing on it, just a dry, wet, dry towel, and I'm just taking a wipe it, wipe it off. Because sometimes with flat irons, not sometimes, with flat irons, they can have product built up on them. And you just want to wipe them off. For a comb, using combs with thermal irons, they have different sizes and 
the way you hold the comb also matters. The comb should be about seven inches long and it should be made of a hard rubber and another non-flammable substance and should have fine teeth to firmly hold the hair. It's a heat resistant comb. It, it, won't, it won't melt if you're putting the hair, the comb in the hair after it's been flat ironed. If you have the flat iron close to it and you're following your comb down to the ends of the hair with the flat iron, it won't melt it because it has non-flammable substance on the comb. And when you have smaller teeth, it's able to smooth out that hair as you're going along and getting all the hair strands straight. You wanna hold the comb between the thumb and the four fingers of the non-dominant hand because you're using your dominant hand to control the flat iron as you're smoothing it out going down the hair strand. And with your index finger resting on the backbone of the comb for better control, and you have one end of the comb resting against the outer edge of the palm. When you're holding it like this, it ensures that you have a strong hold and, and you have firm movement when you're going down the hair strand and the hair is holding in place. When you're manipulating thermal irons, you wanna grasp the handles with your dominant hand. You wanna place three middle fingers on back of the lower handle with the little finger in front and thumb in front of upper handle. And you wanna practice rolling the cold irons. So the best way to practice this is by rolling the cold iron in your hand. When you're practicing your rolling cold irons, rolling it in your hand first forward, and then you wanna do it backwards. With the rolling movement, it should be done without any sway or motion in the arm. So you should not be moving your arms. You should only be moving your fingers. That those are the only things that are moving when you're rolling in each direction. And just keep in mind that when you're using thermal irons, you want to make sure that you are comfortable in the position that you're holding the flat, the thermal iron is comfortable for you when you're going through the process. So just keep that in mind. Make sure you're comfortable at all times, especially with the way you're holding it so that it doesn't slip, you don't drop it, it doesn't fall on the client, it doesn't burn the client. Just want to make sure that you're comfortable. You're your, the setting temp, the temperature setting depends on the texture of the hair. So if you have coarse, more coarse hair, you can have a higher setting. If you have fine hair, you want to put on the lower setting. What, and you have to think about if it's lightened or bleached or if it has been colored. So all those things come into play. The hair that hair that has been lightened or tinted, as well as white hair, should be curled and waved with gentle heat always gentle heat, never nothing, anything high because it's going to damage their hair. Being that light hair, lightened hair has already been broken down, if you use a high heat, it's just going to damage it even more. And as a rule, when you have coarse, as a rule, coarse and gray hair can withstand more heat than fine hair. Coarse hair and gray hair the hair strand, the cuticles, they're, they're thicker. So they're able to hold and retain more heat and will stand more heat as opposed to someone who has lightened hair or fine hair. When it comes to temperature, there's no, there's no correct temperature when you're using with the iron, with iron, ugh. there's no correct temperature used for the irons when you're thermal curling or thermal waving the hair. So when you're curling, waving the hair, you just kind of, you want to wrap it and get like a wand and wrap it on there. As you're wrapping it, that hair strand that's being wrapped previously is already hot. So once you get to the end of that hair strand, the hair is wrapped. I mean, the hair is curled. So there's no correct temperature for that. Just boom, boom. some people can get theirs done and it curls faster than the others. Some of them are, are thicker and more coarse. You have to leave it on there for a little bit longer than normal. But there's no, like the book is stating, there's no single correct temperature.
when you're thermal curling with electric with electric thermal irons. A modern thermal iron and a hard rubber comb are all you need to give your clients curls when you're thermal curling with electric thermal irons. Thermal curling, they don't require no setting gels or lotions, and it can be used to your great it can be used to great advantage on straight hair, pressed hair, wigs, and hair pieces. With straight hair, thermal irons. Thermal curling permits quick styling because it eliminates the need for rollers, which are placed in the wet hair and a long hair drying process. When you're doing on pressed hair, thermal curling permits styling the hair without the danger of it returning to its former extremely curly condition and it prepares the hair for any desired style. So it holds longer. With the wigs and hair pieces, human hair, of course, thermal curling presents a quick and effective method for styling. When you're manipulating, when you're doing manipulations with the curling iron, you want to practice turning the iron. You want to practice releasing the hair and practice guiding the hair strand and practice removing the curl from the iron. So like I say, like in the pictures that they have below, so you want to practice turning the iron. Remember, you're not moving your hand, you're just moving your fingers in a back, a forward and motion. And you want to practice releasing the hair. So you want to move the with your finger, your three fingers, and it's able to help you move. So you can release the hair as you're guiding, as you're guiding the hair strand, and then you want to practice removing the curl from the iron. These things are all important because are important to practice and develop because it helps with your rotation and your movement. So when it says practice releasing the hair, you wanna open and close the iron in a quick clicking movement. Even when you're guiding the hair strand into the center of the curl as you rotate the iron, this movement ensures that the end of the strand is firm, is firmly in the center of the curl. When then once you get the curl in and it's set, you want to and you have to remove the curl from the iron. You want to do that by drawing it with the comb to the left and the rod to the right. So you're placing the comb and you're moving the comb and the rod in opposite directions. The comb is going to go left and the rod is going to go right. 
and you want to use the comb to help you prevent the client's scalp from burns. Four basic curl patterns. You have a root curl, you have a spiral curl, you have waves, and you have end curls. Your root curl creates volume in the hair movement and a curl formation from roots to ends. It is the most commonly used technique and works best on short or long layered hair. Your spiral curl is a method of curling the hair by winding a strand around the rod and it creates a vertical corkscrew effect and works best on one length hair to create volume. That's a, a popular one right now, the spiral curling and also the waves. The waves create an S, an S pattern and gives texture and volume to the hair. Waves are popular plastic technique that can be applied on any texture and length, usually a surface enhancer. So the spiral curl and the waves are really popular right now. Everyone wants the wave with the straight ends or like the spiral curl with the straight ends. So those are really popular curls to, in today's time. Volume-based curls are sectioned off base. You want to hold the strand at a 135-degree angle. You want to slide the iron over strand. You want to wrap the strand over the rod with medium tension and maintain position for five seconds. Then you want to roll the curl and place on base. In your volume, your volume-based curls, it provides you maximum lift or volume since the curls place very high on the base. You want to um, and to maintain this, you have to hold it for five seconds in order to heat the strand and set the base. And roll the curl in the usual manner and firmly place it forward and high on its base. Then we have full base curls. Full base curls sit in the center of their base and provide a strong curl with full volume. The section off base is shown and you hold the hair strand at a 125 degree angle. You wanna slide the iron over the hair strand about a half an inch from the scalp. You wanna wrap the strand over the rod with medium tension. You wanna maintain the position for about five seconds to heat it. And all these are about five seconds. You can count in your head or just sing like a quick little song or do whatever works for you to get to five seconds to, to heat it up. And then you wanna roll the curl in the same manner and place it firmly on the center of the base. Then we have half base curls. Half base curls sit half off their base and provide a strong curl with moderate lift or volume. This section, you wanna section it off base, which is shown right here in figure 17-4 in your Milady book, page 465. And you wanna hold the hair at a 90 degree angle. You wanna slide the hair, the iron over the hair strand about a half an inch from the scalp. And you wanna wrap the strand over the rod with medium tension. And also your same thing, maintain it for five seconds, sing a song, sing a little quick second, five second, like a little beat or something, count to five, either way, just get to five seconds. And then you want to roll the curl in the usual manner and place it half off its base. And then we have half off base curls. 
Off base curls are placed completely off their base and offer a curl option with only slight lift or volume. You want to section off base as shown previously and you want to hold the hair at a 70 degree angle. Then slide the iron over the hair strand about a half an inch from the scalp. And you want to wrap the hair, wrap the strand over the rod with medium tension. You want to maintain this position for about five seconds. And to heat the strand, inset the base. You want to roll the curl in the usual manner, usual manner and place it completely off its base. So with all these curls, you have your volume-based thermal curls, you have your full base, you have your half base, you have your off base. You have to keep the position for five seconds so that it can heat the whole, so it can heat throughout the whole hair strand, the whole curl and get it curled so that you can set it and place it on the base that is required for volume, full base, half base, off base. Your finished thermal curl, your finished thermal curl settings. I think I've said curl too much today. For best results, when giving a thermal setting, clip each curl in place until the whole head has been curled and is ready for styling. Then you wanna brush the hair working up from the neckline and brushing the waves into place as you progress over the entire head. If the hairstyle is to be finished with curls, do the bottom curls last. So what they mean by this is once as you're curling the hair, you want to set them in place so that the heat, so it can cool down and that curl can be set in place. So once it's cooled down, that curl is set. And that way it gives you, when you're brushing out the hairstyle or brushing into the style, it doesn't lose its curl. So let's talk about how to use thermal iron safely. Read the instructions or get the instructions for the use of the iron and you wanna keep your iron clean. Keeping it clean is important because it doesn't get built up, the product is not on there and it doesn't burn. You don't wanna overheat it. You wanna always test this temperature, handle it carefully and you wanna place the hot irons in a safe place to cool down. And when you're heating uh, a conventional iron, you don't want to place the handle too close to the heater because your hand might be burned when you're removing the iron. So just keep that in mind when you're, if you're using a conventional iron where you're placing it so you don't burn yourself. And you also want to keep your hot, your thermal irons away and out of reach for people to touch them. Or if you have kids, you don't want the kids to come in there and knock them over or touch them because kids like to touch everything. I have three of them. They are into everything. So just keep that in mind as well. And you want to use, when you're using a conventional iron, you want to make sure that it's properly balanced in the heater or it might fall and it get damaged or it can also injure somebody. So that that has happened to me before. It, I've dropped, um, I went to go pick up a different tool and accidentally yanked the cord from my flat iron or no sorry my curling iron and it like fell to the floor don't ever catch it let it drop if it breaks that's just what happens and you have to buy another one but just let it drop and just try and make sure it doesn't hit your client or touch you because that can be bad. I've grabbed a flat iron before and I will never do it again. I will let it drop and just have to replace it. You wanna use only hard rubber or non-flammable combs, so heat resistant combs, and they must be used with thermal curling. No, celluloid combs must not be used, sorry, in thermal curling because they are flammable. They will burn. So don't use them. And you do not ever want to use a metal comb. They can become super hot and they can burn the scalp. And you want to place the comb between the scalp and the thermal iron when you're curling or waving the hair to prevent the scalp from burning. Let's, let's go over a couple more, a couple more of them. 
and also in your if y'all want to go back into the book later on and kind of jot these down in your own words just so you can mentally remember them and study them that's also a good thing to do so that you know what you should do to practice using them safely and when you're using it on the client's hair the client's hair must be clean and completely dry there should be no moisture in the client's hair when you're using a thermal iron that way you can ensure that your curling is going to be on point and also if you're flat ironing your flat iron is going to be on point and you're not going to burn the hair you're not going to hear a sizzle if you hear a sizzle that means there's some moisture in the hair or you've used too much product and it will cause a lot of smoke and it won't smell too hot. You don't want to allow the hair in, you do not want to allow the hair ends to produce, protrude over the iron. This causes fish hooks. The hair that is bent is folded. So that also is true, but nowadays people want the fish hook. That the fish hook is the straight ends. So say you're getting your hair waved and you want the ends to be straight, that is technically a fish hook. So a fish hook, when they made this book, was wrong, but a fish hook now is okay, except for when a client wants the hair to be, to be completely curled from roots to end, then that is not okay. When you're ironing lightened, tinted, or relaxed hair, always use a gentle heat setting because light and tinted and relaxed hair is already fragile so you don't want to use a high heat setting it will damage their hair so bad it's not even funny and then it will have you having to go through and protect their repair their hair <laughs> which just make more work for yourself so you, and you also want to use proper technique when curling the hair to avoid lines of demarcation. So you don't want to create a line in the hair when you're using a thermal iron or you're curling in the hair. So make sure it all flows, make sure your technique is on point so that when you're going through the hair, you're curling the hair, you're smoothing the hair out, you don't have those lines in the hair of demarcation of where you've put the flat iron or where you've stopped and it moved or it got kind of stuck or something you don't want to keep this you want to make sure everything flows together so you don't have no lines of demarcation and again I can't stress this enough just like the book cannot stress it enough you always want to use them protected in the hair to protect it from heat damage Thermal hair straightening temporarily straightens extremely curly or resistant hair by means of a heated iron or comb. So your hot comb, your flat iron. And they generally last up until the hair has been is shampooed. Or if it's too humid outside and the hair will revert back slowly and get poopy. Also prepares the hair for additional services such as thermal curling and We, yeah, y'all, I can't even pronounce that one.
crokinal thermal curling, which is also the two loop or figure eight, figure eight technique. I had to really look at that hooked on phonics for a second. Good hair pressing leaves the hair in a natural and lustrous condition and is not harmful to the hair. You have three different types of uh, hair straightening. You have a soft press, you have a medium press, and you have a hard press. Your soft press, which removes about 50 to 60% of the curl, and it is accomplished by applying the thermal pressing comb once on each side of the hair. So you just use a pressing comb, you go, you apply it once to the, the top part of the hair, and then you apply it once to the other side of the hair. On your medium press, which removes about 60 to 75% of the curl, it is accomplished by applying the thermal pressing comb once on each side of the hair using slightly more pressure. So for the soft press, you're just doing it once, just quickly, like hardly no pressure, just swipe it on both on each side of the hair. But then when you get to medium press, you're gonna do the same thing, but you're gonna apply a little bit more pressure with it. Not a lot of pressure, just a little bit more. And then with your hard press, that will remove 100% of the curl. And it is accomplished by applying the pressing comb twice on each side of the hair. So not once like soft press and medium press, but twice and on each side of the hair. And the hard press can also be done by first passing a hot thermal iron through the hair, which is called a double press. When you're preparing the hair for, pre for pressing, you want to want to do an analysis of the hair and scalp. So before you press a client's hair, you will need to analyze the condition of the hair and the scalp. So it will, you know, if you can't remember what that is, you can go back to chapter 11 and you can review the steps for hair and scalp analysis and the properties of the hair and scalp. If the client's hair and the scalp are not healthy, you should give appropriate advice concerning corrective treatments and do not perform the service. They may be upset, but it will better be better for them if they waited and you got their hair healthy and prepared their hair and got their hair strong enough to be able to sustain a hair pressing. So in the case of a scalp, a scalp skin disease, it is not your job as a cosmetologist to diagnose them. You have to refer them to a doctor or dermatologist. And if the hair shows signs of neglect or abuse caused by faulty pressing, lightening or tinting, recommend a series of condition treatments. So this is where you go into recommending what type of treatments, what kind of plan y'all can get on to get the client's hair ready and strong enough to be able to sustain being pressed. And you have to remember to always check your client's hair elasticity and process, process, porosity under normal conditions. If a client's hair has good elasticity, it can be stretched to about 50% of its original length before breaking when wet. If the porosity is normal, the hair will return to its natural wave pattern when it is wet or moistened. So a careful analysis of the client's hair and scalp should cover the following points. The wave pattern of the hair, the length of the hair, texture of the hair, whether it's coarse, medium, or fine, the way the hair feels, whether it's wiry, soft, or silky, the elasticity of the hair, the color of the hair, whether it's a natural color, the color is faded, it's streaked with any highlights, it's gray, has gray hair, it's tinted, or it's lightened, so it's bleached. The condition of the hair, the hair is normal, if it's brittle, if it's dry, if the hair is oily, damaged, or it's chemically treated, and you also want to pay attention to the condition of the scalp with its normal, flexible, or tight. So if you've ever seen someone's scalp that is flexible, it will move. The client's scalp will move. A normal, a tight scalp, it it's super tight, it doesn't move. But when you have normal, it, it has a little bit of movement, but it's also very, it's also tight. You as a cosmetologist, these things are important to recognize in individual differences in the hair texture, the porosity, the elasticity, the scalp flexibility. So those things are very important to familiarize yourself with, drill them deep in your brain, 
so that you can recognize whether to provide the service to a client or suggest treatments to help get their hair to be able to sustain the service that they're looking for. Hair texture comes in a lot of variations, which are coarse, overly curly, medium, fine, and wiry. And the way they the, the way the hair feels, it can be also silky and it can also be soft as well. When you're touching the client's hair and asking about specific hair characteristics, you it will help you determine the best way to treat the hair. If the client has coarse or extremely curly hair, it has qualities that make it difficult to press. So with coarse hair, the greatest it has the greatest diameter and during the pressing process, it requires more heat and pressure than medium or fine hair. So that is when that is where your hard press comes into play with coarse hair. With medium curly hair, it is the it is like It is the hair type that we deal with majority of the time in a salon. There's no like special problem that you see in a medium curly hair type. And it's the least resistant to pressing. So with medium hair, whether it's curly, straight, fine, this is your most versatile, you're able to do more with the medium hair type and texture is what you'll see majority of the time that's in your chair. With fine hair, it requires special care. You wanna avoid the hair breakage and you wanna use less heat and pressure than you would on other hair textures like medium or coarse hair. With wiry curly hair, you may it may be coarse sometimes and or medium or fine and it feels stiff, hard or glassy. But because of the compact construction of its cuticle cells, the hair that this hair type is resistant to hair pressing and requires more heat and pressure than other hair types. So with wiry hair, you're gonna have to do a double press, which is your hard press. You might even have to do a little bit more heat than normal as well. So as I talked about earlier, a couple of slides ago, the scalp conditions can vary from normal, flexible, and tight. And tight comes majority of the time with coarse hair. If the scalp is normal, you wanna proceed with analysis of the hair texture and elasticity. And if the scalp is tight and the hair is coarse, you wanna press the hair in a direction in which it grows to avoid injury to the scalp. If the scalp is flexible, you wanna to remember to always use enough tension to press the hair satisfactorily. You want to be sure to record the results of the of your hair and scalp analysis as well as all pressing treatments. This comes with client client cards. They they sell them at Sally's. You can go get some at Sally's and put them in like a little cute binder. Um, and you can write down all the notes for your that one specific client and keep them for future references. It's always nice to have them just in case something changes or the client comes in with say the hair needing to be repaired and you started the process and you're jotting, taking your notes down and you, you can see the progression from where they started to where they are. You wanna question the client about any lightener, tint, gradual colors, 
or other chemical treatments that have been used on her hair, on her hair or his hair. So you want to ask the client these questions because sometimes they will not tell you the truth and you have to find out later. So you always want to make sure to ask them. And if they, if you, they don't know, you can always also tell in the hair when you're looking at it. Your, tra- your eyes will be trained to be able to tell if the hair has been, has any chemical alterations to it. You also want the client to sign, to have a release statement and that should be signed all the time. Prior to hair pressing, prior to any color, any chemical service, you want to have a release statement. It protects you, the, the stylist. It protects your salon. If you're working for a salon, it protects that salon. If you're in school, it protects the school. It protects you from any of the li- any liability due to accidents or damage. I cannot stress it enough. I've seen so many times where a, a stylist did not have a client sign a release statement and something happened and the client sued the stylist or sued the salon because the stylist worked underneath that salon. And when I noticed those things and saw those things happening, I always make sure my clients sign a release statement or a chemical release form. I don't do anything that requires a chemical without that being signed. Conditioning treatments contain like a scalp massage, cosmetic preparations, and you can also do it through brush, through thorough brushing. An effective conditioning treatment helps you prepare the hair to keep it keep it healthy for any style. You can also use it do it with the scalp massage before you're doing any hair pressing, before you're doing any coloring, before you're doing anything. You want to make sure that these conditioning treatments are helping you in your process. A tight scalp can be made more flexible by the systematic use of a scalp massage or hair and hair brushing. You can loosen the scalp by massaging the scalp a little bit in circular motions or also brushing it. It loosens the scalp and allows it to move. The clients also benefit because there's better circulation of blood to the scalp. There are two different types of pressing combs. You have a regular and you have electric. Both should be constructed of good quality stainless steel or brass. The handle is usually made of wood because the wood does not readily absorb heat. The space between the teeth of the comb varies with the size and style of the comb. When it's closely placed, spaced teeth provide a smooth press. As spacing gets wider, the press gets less smooth. And pressing combs also come in various sizes. Shorter combs are used to press short hair and lower combs are used to press longer hair. A process you, tempering the comb is a process used to condition a new brass pressing comb so that it heats evenly. It heat, heat the comb until it's extremely hot. Then you wanna coat the comb in petroleum or pressing oil. It's kind of like you have those hot, those iron skillets and you have to keep them with oil oil on them. So you make them really, really hot and then you coat them in oil. It's the same thing for a pressing comb. Then you wanna let it cool down naturally and then rinse under hot water to remove the oil. The tempering also burns off any polish the manufacturer may have used to coat the comb.
when you're heating a comb, depending on what the comb is made of, pressing combs vary in their ability to accept and retain heat. Regular pressing combs, they're designed as an electrical appliance or to be heated in electric or gas stoves. When you're heating a pressing comb in a gas stove, you wanna point the teeth face up and keep the handle away from the fire. After heating the comb to the proper temperature, test it on a piece of paper, as we stated earlier, so make sure the paper it's not too hot and the paper burns and it's too hot and you let it cool down before applying it to the client's hair. When you have your electric pressing combs, those are also available in two forms. One comes with an on-off switch and the other is equipped with a thermostat that indicates high or low degrees, degrees of heat. Straightening comb attachments are available as well. I haven't seen none personally, but I know they are available. I don't even know if they sell them anymore. I haven't seen none in a store, so I don't know if they still sell them. Um, but you probably can find them on Amazon. You can find anything on Amazon. Even though these attachments are even even though these attachments are less damaging than either an electric comb or an over, overheated comb, they may also be less effective at pressing the hair. When the pressing comb is clean, it works a whole lot better. So you want to keep it clean. You want to wipe the comb clean of any of the loose hair that's come off that has came that has come off in the mist in the process of you pressing it. You want to and dust before and after every use. Once all loose hair and clinging dirt is removed, the comb's intense heat keeps it sterile. So with it being so hot, it'll keep it clean and will burn off any like germs or particles that have got on the hair. So just remember to keep it clean. It just works better. Pressing oil or cream makes hair softer, prepares the hair for pressing, prevents the hair from burning. It helps prevent breakage. It conditions the hair after pressing, it adds sheen and helps retain the press. So your pressing oil is like a heat protectant and serum and leave-in conditioner all in one. That's pretty much what the pressing oil or, or cream cream is. Your hard press is only recommended when the results of a soft or medium press are not satisfactory. So your hard press is your last option. If you've done it, a soft press and that didn't work and you've done a medium press and that still hasn't gotten the hair as straight as you want it to, then you'll do your, do your double comb press, which is your hard press. The entire comb press procedure is repeated, hence double. And the pressing oil should be added to the hair strands only if it is necessary. If it is not needed, do not apply it. A hard press is also known as a double press. And touch-ups. With touch-ups, the process is the same as for the original pressing treatment with the shampoo omitted.
here's a couple of reminders and hints for, for any pricing procedure that you're going to do or offer to your clients, offer to your clients in your salon or, or that you may do at school while you're still in school. You want to avoid excessive heat or pressure on the hair and scalp. You want to recommend a conditioning treatment mask. And also you want to avoid too much pressing oil on the hair. Avoid perfume pressing oil near the scalp. You want to avoid too frequent hair pressing. You don't want to get, you don't want them to get too many done too closely together. It can damage the hair. You want to keep the comb clean at all times. Avoid overheating the pressing comb if using a stove. You want to test the temperature of the heated comb on a white cloth or paper before applying the hair to make sure it's not too hot. And if it is too hot, you want to let it cool down before you put it on the client's head. You want to adjust the temperature to the texture and hair condition. Use the heated comb carefully to avoid burning the skin, scalp, or hair. Prevent the, prevent the smoking or burning of hair. That's not a good sign if that is doing that. One, the pressing comb may be too hot or you have too much product pressing oil on the hair. Use a moderately warm comb to press short hair. And if the hair texture is fine and not too coarse, you may consider using a flat iron on high heat instead of using a pressing comb. So if your client has fine hair and it's coarse but not too coarse, a flat iron will work just fine. So some special considerations that you should take when you're dealing with pressing fine hair, pressing short hair, that's fine. Pressing coarse hair or pressing tinted light or gray hair. So when you're pressing fine hair, you wanna follow the same procedures for normal hair. While avoiding the use of a hot pressing comb or too much pressure, you may wanna consider using a flat iron. I would use a flat iron I wouldn't use a, a pressing comb because it would just be too hot and it would be too too much on that client's hair. And you want to avoid as much breakage as possible and not having to put so much pressure on that hair near the ends of the hair because it can also break the hair. When you're doing, when you're pressing short, fine hair, you want to take extra care at the hairline. When the hair is extra short, the pressing comb should not be too hot. So you want to make sure you're when you're testing it, if it doesn't um, burn or scorch the the cloth or the paper towel, just make sure it gets a little bit, a little bit more cool down, and then use it on the client's hair because their hair can burn easily. A hot comb it can cause painful burns. I don't know about y'all, but when I was a kid, I got burned so many times by a hot comb that I cannot stand hot combs to this day they scare me even at a th as a 30 year old if I get someone wants to use a hot comb I'm jumping and I'm flinching like a little girl all over again it's, it's embarrassing but that can happen uh, when you're pressing coarse hair you want to apply enough pressure so that the hair remains straightened when you're pressing colored hair or gray hair which is unpigmented it has no pigment in it the hair requires special care it can, will require some conditioning treatments if it's lightened, depending on the extent to which it has been damaged. And gray hair may be particularly resistant. More times than not, gray hair is resistant. 
And so to obtain good results on gray hair, you want to use moderately heated pressing comb to apply with light pressure and you want to avoid excessive heat as you can cause discoloration. So you can change the color of their hair. It gets like, it can get yellowy, like a yellow tone to it and you can cause breakage. Let's get into the fun part, updos. Updos are also known as a specialty style. It is a hairstyle with the hair arranged up and off the shoulders and secured with implements such as hair pins, bobby pins, and elastic, so rubber bands or point holders. Then you have your updos. Your updos are designed for long or very long hair, and this is where the hair is half pulled back and off the face and pinned at or below the crown. So when you're doing an updo, you want to prepare. You want to have that set up and ready to go with all the tools you need, the sectioning you're going to use, the penny, your balance, and your texture. When you're preparing the tools and materials, your, your tools and materials are essential before beginning an updo so that you have everything you need. You need your bobby pins, you need your, if you need your teasing brush, if you need a comb, if you need a curling iron, if you need um, hairspray or dry shampoo. You wanna have all those things prepared and ready to go. And you also wanna make sure the hair has been cleaned. Um, maybe I would suggest the client wash their hair one or two days before they're gonna get their hair done. So it's slightly dirty. So it has more hold and more grip to the updo. When you're sectioning the hair before you do an updo, this allows you to have control and it, has, it allows you to work clean and it makes everything flow together and just makes it easier and less stressful. Every updo has a sectioning pattern. Some people follow those patterns. Some people just wing it. I am a wing it updo kind of girl. I don't work well when a client shows me pictures for updos because I always tell clients that's very pretty, but I didn't do that updo and she will, she may do it differently than, than how I would do it. So I would do my best to get you as close to the picture as possible, but I'm going to guarantee you that it's not going to be this exact same picture. One, either that client, your client, your chair doesn't have that same hair type or texture or thickness. And so things may have to be done slightly different. And more times than not, the client's very understanding. So to keep your updo secure, there's one thing to remember when you're doing this because you can end up with 5,000 bobby pins or hair pins in the client's hair that less is more. So you have your hair pins, which are open-ended and can be anchored by bending one end of the pin back. So when it is inserted, it automatically locks into place. And they work best on the hair that has been back combed because it has that teasing in there. So it just will lock in there. Oh, or a back brushed, either one. And you're because it has that base. Bobby pins have a different function as they are used to keep the hair tight to the head and can be interlocked to secure it in place. So a little trick that I learned when I went to an updo class back in Philadelphia with bobby pins. Bobby pins, so you see this, this opening right here of the bobby pin? That's the amount of hair that a bobby pin can hold. When you open a bobby pin and try and stick it in the hair, you're putting too much hair in that bobby pin and it will not hold the bobby pin. It will just, it won't hold it as tightly as you want it to. So a little trick that I learned, and I'll show you guys when we're in class, is with the bobby pin, you just stick it, stick it in where you got want it to go, because that bobby pin will grab all the hair that is needed to fit in this spacing, and it will hold it in place. It changed my life when I discovered that. It was mind-blowing, and I'll show you guys what I mean um, when we're in class together. Then you have your balance. Balance is often overlooked and can be the difference between a flattering style or one that is not. 
The head shape, neckline, and facial structure should be analyzed before committing to a look, and it is good to practice to stand back and away from your work to make sure that the palette balance is right. And also use the mirror. So when you're doing an updo, every so often as you're going throughout the updo, like halfway through the updo, you want to step back. And I do this to this day. I step back and I look at the client through the mirror and look at the balance of the hair to make sure it's balanced. If I need to change something, give more height, add more teasing. Stepping back will literally change your view of what you're doing because you're so close and your your tunnel vision is what you're doing so once you step back you get the whole overall look of what's going on and you can continue on your texture is what creates the foundation that allows you to build your shape design your style and customize it to the individual with different styling tools and products we can manipulate and create any texture you have two different foundational styles. You have your ponytail, which is your foundation for a chignon, a bun, a knot, and knot, and among other styles, which can be placed on various parts of the head. It can be worn casual, classic, or trendy. With the ponytail, you could, it could be low, it could be medium, it can be high. Um, it can be curly, it can be messy, it can be sleek and smooth. It can be two ponytails that you can join and may look like it's one complete one. It can be done in various ways. Then you have your French pleat. This can be applied to straight or curly hair with length below the shoulder. It is one of the more elegant styles and can be adapted for every age group. And then you have your bun. Your bun is a classic is classic and is great for all occasions. And it can be seen, people normally wear buns on red carpets, runways, different things like that. It can be high or low, twisted around the ponytail or back brushed and formed into a bun. And it's secured with a ponytail holder or an elastic hairband and a few bobby pins and some accessories like hair jewelry. And then you have your twist, which is also to, which is a French pleat, which we just talked about. Your French pleat is one of a, is an elegant hairstyle and it can be applied to any age group. A lot of people get these here and there when they're going to like formal events or weddings or different things like that. Those where those come into play. But nowadays, the more trendy ones are like your half updos with the braids or like your curly, messy looks. Some people like them straight, like the smooth, sleek looks, but that's few and far between from what I've seen lately. But they're all pretty classic. They're all the, they're classic. And they look good with any, any hair type, any hair texture. A client consultation determines the client's desires and what they want to see at the end of their service or what they want to achieve, as well as if their hair is damaged and if they want to achieve healthy hair. You can also use magazines and books to give a client a visual, just in case what they're explaining doesn't make sense. They can point out a picture and say, this is what I mean, this is what I want. And you also can do a consultation, like a pre-wedding consultation. A consultation, we'll talk about that all the time because it's something that you have to do. You can't escape a consultation, no matter what you're doing. No matter if you're doing a color service, uh, just a typical shampoo style, no matter if you're doing an updo, um, if you're pressing the client's hair, if you're doing braids if you're doing applying if you're doing a wig it doesn't matter you always need to do a consultation and if you're doing one for a bride those ones you have to figure out the theme suggest different styles what each person may want to have like each different bridesmaid they're going to have different hair if it's all going to be the same like every consultation is different but you always have them Hairstyling, it offers a cosmetologist, it's a wonderful outlet for us. 
we get to be creative. We get to express our love for hair when we're hairstyling. Once you master the basic styles that we've presented in this chapter and the foundational techniques these styles require, that these styles require, you will have the technical abilities to experiment and create your own unique and attractive looks. So once you get the basic down, you can play with them and put your own twist, your own spin to them and make them your own and achieve them in a way that works for you without having to go by the book. But you have to get the basics down. You have to get that foundation down first. So now we reached about the end. Let's go over the summary with summary really quick. The more you develop dexterity, coordination, and finger strength, the better you will be able to accomplish beautiful hairstyling. Pin curls serve the foundation for patterns, lines, waves, curls, and rolls that are used to create a wide variety of hairstyles for all ages. Rollers are used to create many of the same effects as stand-up pin curls with the advantage that rollers hold more, much more hair than pin curls, which saves you more time, which saves you time. And you can get more done and you can get your client in and out quicker than if you were to do pin curls. In addition, the use of rollers gives a stronger and longer lasting style due to the tension used in wrapping the hair around the roller. In this presentation, we have also learned that styling the hair with the handheld blow dryer and curling iron has become a standard hairstyling technique. We simply apply the principles of wet hairstyling with these quick service tools. When you're hair pressing, it can be very lucrative. It can be a very lucrative service in the salon. That's also very true. A lot of people want their hair pressed and you can charge accordingly based off of you and your work and what you feel your, your service is worth. And you can make a good amount of money doing a, a pressing service. Good judgment should be used to avoid damage to the hair and scalp. Always do a hair and scalp analysis. Make sure the hair is able to sustain pressing. Make sure it's not damaged. Make sure it's healthy and it's strong before you perform the service. We have also discussed the importance of becoming skillful and offering long hair updos for those important events such as proms, weddings, and black tie affairs. If you've got the basics for an updo, which is your twist, your bun, your shinyang, you can apply that to you can apply that to any updo that you see. So we've reached the end of this chapter. It was a long chapter, hence why we did it in two parts, but we made it through. So what I want you guys to do is I want y'all to answer the verification questions. 
for this for this chapter for this for part two and as well as once you do the exam for this chapter And for activity today, for activity for this chapter, we're gonna set up our workstation for a blow dry service. You're gonna shampoo and condition your mannequin. You're gonna towel dry the hair to prepare for a basic, a basic blow dry. I want y'all to choose the brush you wanna use, whether it's a round brush or a paddle brush, but a round brush is preferred. And I want you to section the hair into eight sections. And we're gonna begin in the front of the head to practice brush movements and smoothing of the hair. We'll take about 30 to 45 minutes to get as much blow dried as we can. And I'm gonna help y'all along the way as we're doing this. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask me while we're doing this activity. So that will be the end of this presentation today. Good luck, don't stress it. It's a lot of information that you guys got from part one and part two. But once we put it all together, it'll all begin to make a lot more sense once we go along. Y'all have a good day.